Welcome, everybody. We're going to get started in about 30 seconds. Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to get started in just about 10 seconds. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tony Verona, and I'm the Dean of the University of Miami School of Law. I am honored to be moderating the panel today entitled Wrestling with Words, Acronyms and Language in Anti-Racism Advocacy and Actions. Sponsored by the ABA Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice, this panel is one of many in a series of rapid response webinars. We are actively planning additional programming on a variety of issues, so please visit AmericanBar.org slash CRSI uh, for updates um, on these programs. During today's program, we encourage you to ask questions of our panelists through the Q&A, not the chat function. If you do not see the controls, please ensure that your screen is not idle. We will address questions at the end of the panel. We will be sharing a recording of this program with everyone who has registered so that you could uh, share it widely with your networks. And with that, we are thrilled to bring you today's program entitled Wrestling with Words, Acronyms and Language and Anti-Racism Advocacy and Actions. As we noted in our panel announcement, over the last 16 months, we have not only struggled against the pandemic of COVID-19, but also the pandemic of racism, systemic and otherwise. In addressing racism and anti-racist uh, initiatives and programs, we have wrestled with the imprecision and fluidity of language. Does the name people of color successfully encompass black people? Or should we be using the newer term BIPOC? Are indigenous and Native American terms that are synonymous? In my own communities, we have grappled with similar questions. Hispanic strikes many of us as too restrictive and narrow and exclusive of members of our community that are not rooted in Spain and see no allegiance to the Spanish language. Latino is more inclusive and encompassing ethnically, ethnographically, and racially, but it is exclusive of women, transgender, and non-binary people. Latinx has been offered as a new and more inclusive variant, but not without significant controversy and resistance. In the LGBTQ community, or what some call the LGBTQQIP2SAA plus community, I do not have to tell you that what has been mocked as our alphabet soup community acronym, which often changes, has been a source of endless discussion and controversy. I was general counsel and legal director of the human rights campaign in the 1990s, when the movement was bifurcated into one on LGB issues and another on T or transgender rights. Some activists, I among them, insisted that sexual orientation and gender identity are distinct phenomena, but also comprise a spectrum of sexual and gender expression. Our commonality, therefore, argued in favor of a coming together as one movement and the sharing of one label. And we did just that. As with all social justice movements, naming and grouping and alliances and allegiances in the LGBTQ plus community have been difficult. Most of us have settled upon the LGBTQ or LGBTQ plus acronym because they address those who have said, I belong in the community too, but do not fit within the L or the G or the B or the T. The Q for queer, a diffused and reclaimed and redefined word that has been a slur, has become the catch-all category that embraces those of us who are outside of society's gender and sexual orientation norms. 
But the conversation continues with challenges by non-binary people, intersex people, those who are asexual, those who consider them themselves and are cis straight allies and others. This struggle with language and especially nomenclature that implicates and creates boundaries and insider outsider categories is not new to the civil rights community. In fact, it is not at all new to humanity itself. In the Judeo-Christian Old Testament, in fact, we read in Genesis that God, quote, formed out of the earth all the wild beasts and all the birds of the sky, unquote, and then presented them to Adam and Eve so that they would name them. Naming brings with it enormous psychological, social, and connective authority. Naming defines and empowers and enfranchises, but it can also divide and distance. Those of us who speak other languages can see the influence that naming bears upon our thinking. How we think of things and people is often dictated by what we have named them or what they have named themselves. A partner in English is someone who shares a part of a whole. In Spanish and French, a partner is un compañero or un copain, literally someone with whom we share pan or pan, bread, right? The meaning, therefore, is warmer, is more human as a result of that distinction in naming. In English, fish is what swim in the ocean as well as what we eat. In Spanish, un pez is a fish that is autonomous and alive, whereas un pescado literally is a fish that has been caught and killed for food. The naming of fish in Spanish, therefore, pays more respect to the reality of the fish's fate and purpose and our effect on its life. Finally, those, who, uh, those of us who speak other languages know how difficult it is when something that is named in one language has no name in another. In English, the expression, I look forward to, has no equivalent in Spanish. And the French, esprit du couloir, or esprit d'escalier, loosely translated corridor wit or staircase wit, is the phenomenon that we all experience of thinking of the best retort, the best answer to a question well after the moment has passed and we're making our way home. Our panelists today are the best possible colleagues from whom we can make sense of this challenge of wrestling with words and getting the names right in the civil rights and social justice contexts. Professor Latoya Baldwin Clark is Assistant Professor of Law at UCLA School of Law. Professor Kirsten Carlson is Associate Professor of Law at Wayne State University Law School. And my friend, Professor Mira Deo, is Professor of Law, Thomas Jefferson School of Law, and the 2020-2021 William H. Newcomb Fellows Research Chair in Diversity and Law at the American Bar Foundation. I thank these illustrious panelists and my dear colleague and friend, Professor Francine Lippmann at UNLV and everyone at the ABA who has made today's webinar possible. I believe that Professor Deo will present first and then Professor Carlson, uh, followed by Professor Baldwin Clark. I will then uh, facilitate a Q&A with all of us. So I very much encourage you to post questions to the Q&A box that I could then use to uh, present to our panelists. So now without any further delay, here is Professor Dale. Thank you so much for that framework and for starting us off with that broad international context, but also sharing some detailed nuanced perspectives from within communities. Um, so I, I really appreciate both of those frameworks for thinking through how we can wrestle with language, um, which is our goal today. So I'm going to share my screen and get started. So um, I wanna start by thanking not only Dean Tony Verona for those opening remarks, but also the ABA section on civil rights and social justice and the American Bar Foundation for 
co-sponsoring this event today. Professor Francine Littman, as Dean Barona mentioned, deserves special praise for really conceiving of this session and bringing us all together. And thank you again, especially to Dean Tony Verona, Professor Kirsten Matoy Carlson, and Professor Latoya Baldwin Clark for agreeing to share their thoughts here today as well. So I'm sharing with you a work in progress that questions the utility of the term BIPOC. It suggests instead that we be clearer and use more sophisticated ideas in our usage of language and advocacy efforts. Uh, the, the focus here is really on how advocates and allies and academics think about language. So it's not in any sense to suggest that individuals should identify themselves the way that I suggest in an academic paper. Um, my preference is to call you whatever you want me to call you. This is really about how others refer to a group as a whole. A week or two from now, Virginia Law Review Online is publishing an essay of mine that really delves into this topic um, in a broad way. It sort of plants a flag about practical reasons why BIPOC fails. But what I'm presenting today is a work in progress that sort of applies this thesis to the context of legal education. So the article has three interrelated proposals. Uh, the first one is that we recognize the importance of critically examining existing frameworks, including the terms that we use to represent intersectionality and changing conceptions of race, gender, and other identity characteristics. So when appropriate, it is important to update language to reflect current goals and priorities. Secondly, however, terms should not dictate what data is used or which arguments are made. Instead, language should be appropriately matched rather than overbroad when we're reporting on findings or reaching conclusions. And third, using BIPOC as a synonym for people of color does a disservice, I argue, to the people of color history and legacy. Both, um, well, the nascent term actually could and should inspire scholars and advocates to instead think carefully about which groups we do want to prioritize or prefer in certain instances, and then name those relevant racial groups when it is appropriate. In the beginning um, of the article, I traced the evolving language of race as related to the law. So this is grounded in the power of language, um, and especially with regard to whiteness. So from questions of citizenship, schooling, even the ability to testify as a witness, people of color have struggled to prove their belonging in a white space, even as the term white itself has shifted in meaning over time. I have personally been thinking about this even more these past few weeks, hearing powerful testimony from eyewitnesses to George Floyd's murder. As racism evolved over the years, so did the terms that were used to define and explain and resist it. And um, the first term that I wanna to turn to for now is people of color. So this term initially likely referred to enslaved black Americans. At some point though, colored people, this idea of colored people as a group became synonymous uh, with black as in the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And then over time, it grew to encompass more people um, others who are non-white, including those in the Latino or Latinx community, Asian American, Native American, Arab Americans, and others. So uh, the focus here is to uh, highlight, instead of exclusion, inclusion. So move away from non-white or minority to instead counter that sort of lower status by highlighting a positive, by focusing in on inclusion. Um, and also utilizing person first language, highlighting the humanity of the people who are described by the term. Due in part to the rigid racial hierarchy that placed whites at the top of a power structure and excluded people from other races and ethnicities in various ways, those from different backgrounds recognized that there were some benefits to cooperating and banding together with others. So these are um, partly how these coalitions formed between what had until then been disparate non-white groups. Research has shown though that what may get lost in achieving the unity that people of color um, enjoy by grouping together are the unique perspectives and needs of smaller groups who contribute to the whole, whether that's Koreans or Cuban Americans or um, entire communities of, or groups that might not otherwise be prioritized. In response to gender-based marginalization within the larger people of color community, there's also been a shift to include gender identity. 
So this decisive emphasis on what Kimberly Crenshaw termed intersectionality, a combination of these de two devalued identity characteristics centers these groups that were marginalized within one powerful voice or feminist movement, as well as from within the people of color community. So many women uh, of color therefore identify as women of color in addition to people of color. My own previous research builds on intersectionality by introducing theories of race times gender bias, which reflect the compound effects of devaluation that are based on both race and gender. So rather than thinking of them as additive, you are a woman, plus you are a person of color, thinking about how those two identity characteristics intersect and interact with one another. The term woman of color is thus a solidarity definition one that showcases a commitment to working in collaboration with other oppressed women who are also people of color who have been um, subjected to this minority status. And a similar limitation though, as with people of color is that within um, that women of color umbrella can be groups that are obscured um, where you don't see the unique experiences of particular groups gathered beneath the umbrella. So um, that brings us to this new term, BIPOC. Um, this is a synonym for people of color. And um, there's, there has been a lot of confusion just in terms of the, the acronym and what it stands for. Um, my clearest understanding from what little I've found um, suggests that it represents black, indigenous, and people of color. And so that's what the term itself refers to. So recognizing a hierarchy of oppression among communities of color Advocates of BIPOC choose purposefully to prioritize two groups that have been affected by race and racism in a foundational way, um, perhaps creating the foundation of race and racism in the United States. Um, in my mind, and in part what I write about in the article are the ways in which these are sort of winners of the oppression Olympics. Proponents of BIPOC openly resist calls for unity under a people of color umbrella arguing that the P people of color term contributes to native invisibility and anti-blackness. In spite of the reasons given um, that I've just given for supporting this new term, there are nevertheless some shortcomings. Um, this is really what the focus of my article is. I'm gonna focus on three. So the first one is that the advocates assert that the term reframes the black white binary. People of color, I suggest maintains that binary simply adding the word indigenous to the side of black Americans and relegating all other communities of color to other. Furthermore, by intentionally centering two groups, BIPOC by definition marginalizes other communities of color with significant and important histories of race and racism in the United States, including Latinx communities, Asian Americans, and others, while prioritizing historical oppression over contemporary discrimination. And finally, the term promotes, um, in my mind, virtue signaling. So this is when you are using words or actions to um, suggest support for a cause, but really the focus of doing that, um, the primary purpose of doing that is to showcase moral superiority rather than actually pushing for substantive change or drawing from the actual context of the data or the arguments in front of you. So if someone says, for example, that they're working to improve the experiences of BIPOC faculty um, at her law school, like if somebody were to say that to me, I would ask them, how many indigenous faculty members do you have? at your school, right? Otherwise you're centering them in name only when they're not really there in person. Uh, I argue that that does more harm than good, that it contributes to the continued erasure of native communities. So with those terms under our belt, we can turn back to the thesis um, to understand it better and think about when we can center particular groups in particular times. So mix and match different groups, um, or specifically point to particular race times gender groups when it is um, reasonable. So um, understanding the thesis is useful in terms of how we can now apply it to different contexts. And so I'm applying this thesis for today to the context of legal education, focusing on students as well as faculty. So um, right now we're gonna focus just on um, issues involving diversity using data from the Law School Survey of Student Engagement or LESI. So for 17 years, LESI has collected national aggregate data from law students with the help of partner schools. We house the largest repository of law student data in the country um, and it's publicly available. So please feel free to reach out if you are interested in using the data. 
So um, we're, we're gonna think about how the three terms, people of color, women of color, and BIPOC apply in some different instances. So when thinking about how students of color compare to white students, we can consider this first visualization. So if you look at that tallest bar, that's 31% of white students who strongly agree that they are part of the law school community, though lower percentages of all the other groups do. All the other groups are students of color. So here it would make sense to draw a distinction between the experiences of whites versus all others, right? So here we can use that people of color term. But how might this mask the interaction um, and the intersection of race and gender? Women of color, we know, are more likely than men, even from their same race and ethnic backgrounds, to feel they are not part of the campus community. Fewer than a quarter of women of color strongly agree that they are part of the institutional community compared to almost a third of men of color. So if we just looked at that first visualization, we don't really get the nuanced details of gender. We don't understand the ways in which race and gender are interacting. Here, therefore, it's useful to think specifically about women of color as a whole. But we don't have to stop there. Um, we can think even more critically about particular groups. And while I don't um, promote the BIPOC terminology, I think what it can do is encourage us to be specific about which groups we're talking about. So if we go back to that first visualization, we can see that, um, that the smallest bars are that first bar, Native American, and then the bar representing Black students. So it turns out that only 21% of Native American and Black students strongly see themselves as part of the law school community, compared to higher percentages of all other groups, not only white groups, but other students of color as well. So rather than use the word BIPOC here, which pretends that other people of color have the same experiences as Black and Indigenous people, it would be more useful, I argue, to just talk about the experiences of Black and Native students. Next, we can apply the thesis of using precise language to law faculty. So the data that I'm presenting now come from my book project, Unequal Profession, Race and Gender in Legal Academia, published by Stanford University Press in 2019. So in the book, I highlight um, a range of common challenges facing women of color as a whole, but we can actually zoom in now and um, look more particularly at different communities themselves. So faculty of color, if we take sort of a broad lens, face ongoing racial biases. Um, and so right now we're focusing just on student interactions and evaluations. So here's an example from Ed, a multiracial professor who says that his students second guessed everything I did. They wanted a recall on the exam and they demanded explanations. Patricia, a black female professor knows her students quote, want a white male professor. They tell her that openly and she sees it in their interactions. Similarly, Stuart, a Native American professor sees his, um, that his students expect that paper chase professor, you know, who they're used to from the movies. These experiences are distinct from those of white faculty. So if we're thinking about a comparison between faculty of color and whites, you can see grouping together, these communities make sense. And yet the women of color experience considering the combination of race times gender is also instructive. So um, drawing from that same paper chase idea, um, I had an interview with a woman professor named Melissa, a Native American professor who notes that women of color don't fit the mold of the paper chase professor specifically because they are women of color. June, a black woman professor in my sample remembers a comment that clearly drew on combined race times gender bias that read, quote, I know we have to have affirmative action, but do we have to have this woman? While people of color as a whole and women of color in particular face student confrontations, black women are more likely to be fully dismissed. Danielle had a teaching evaluation comment that read, she's black, enough said. She immediately understood that she was, quote, being evaluated based upon things that have nothing to do with my teaching, like skin color. Her blackness and gender combined meant that her students saw her as inferior, a different experience from men of color, including black men, as well as from non-black women of color alike. On the other hand, white, uh, while students regularly comment on the appearance of Asian American women faculty, they rarely focus on skin color. Instead, Asian American faculty members are sometimes viewed as sexual objects, therefore the viewing pleasure of their students. 
Um, this particular quote is instructive. It's from Annie, an Asian American woman professor, um, who said she had a comment on an evaluation that read, she flips her hair over her shoulder too much. Clearly, this has nothing to do with Annie's pedagogical approach or teaching effectiveness. And she was surprised. She told me in our interview, actually, I'm not a coquettish person. I don't know how to flirt. And I think this student was interpreting me as being flirtatious. Race times gender bias can also affect men. Ryan, a black man, recalls uh, one student commented that she was a woman of color and I made her afraid in the classroom drawing on black male stereotypes, uh, stereotypes of black men as criminals or um, frightening or dangerous. Students did not make any other similar fear-based remarks about, pro about professors from any other race, times, gender background, not even professors who were black women, other men of color or any other uh, women of color. And so we should specifically name this as an issue specific to black men. Native American professors um, had especially close relationships with students. Many of them were actually counseled by non-Indigenous colleagues to establish more strict boundaries between themselves and their students, but they found that being more flexible and cultivating close relationships, especially with their Indigenous students who really sought them out, tended to work better for them. Um, so they didn't want to apply that majority approach. So um, to conclude, just thinking of legal education, law students of color have very different experiences than whites when it comes to things like perspectives on diversity and experiences with belonging and comfort on campus. Law faculty members who are people of color also share similarities with regard to student evaluations that differ from the white norm. And these are opportunities for us to draw on that phrase, people of color. Disaggregating by gender within that people of color umbrella to examine the women of color experience often reveals some additional insights. So experiences with diversity have both a racial as well as a gender dimension for students. Similarly, law faculty members face race times gender biases um, from student evaluations and in other contexts that are specific to their backgrounds and identities. Deeper investigations reveal that the term BIPOC as a synonym for people of color adds little value but does cause significant confusion and division by centering two groups of people of color that may not actually be at the center of the discussion at hand. Instead, using purposeful language about the groups that are at the heart of the data or the argument is what is most appropriate. Sometimes neither the term people of color nor the label women of color can tell the full story. Other times it can even eclipse important narratives for particular groups. And in those instances, it's best to be specific about which particular groups are involved and are most affected. So writing simply about people of color or women of color could even itself erase the experiences of particular groups. Um, and in those instances, being specific is the best way forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Deo. And thank you to those of you who have posted questions to Professor Deo. Uh, after all three of our uh, panelists have uh, presented, I will circle back and ask them each uh, the questions that you have uh, posed um, relevant to their present presentations. Um, so let us now go to Professor Baldwin Clark. Sure, thank you. Um, thank you again for having me here. I very much appreciate it. Um, so in my time, I want to focus on the common use of black and brown and research about black and Latinx students in um, United States schools. Um, I wanna talk about this because these two groups are often lumped together because uh, folks assume that the same type of prejudice is working against both types of groups in a way that contributes to the so-called achievement gap. Um, so in most educational contexts, Brown is used to personify Latinx students, faculties, and communities to illustrate ethno-racial coalitions or to underscore parallels to black youth experiences with discriminatory, with discriminatory schooling practices. So if we're gonna use a color to describe uh, African-Americans, we use black. If we're gonna use a color to describe uh, Latinx students, we use brown. And so I wanna assert that using this term black and brown, it's unreasonably conflating and collapsing 
how the two groups encounter white supremacy in the educational context, and how such a conflation can actually stymie efforts at school reform. So let me start with a little known case, which is Mendez versus Westminster. Um, it came out of the Ninth Circuit here in California. So most of us know that the doctrine of separate but equal, that segregated by law, blacks and whites, was officially declared unconstitutional in the 1954 landmark case of Brown versus Board of Education. In that case, which was brought by parents of black children, Chief Justice Earl Warren of the United States Supreme Court wrote for a unanimous court that the separation of black children and white children could never be equal and thus is unconstitutional. But it was a case eight years prior in California that first began chipping away at K through 12 school segregation. And this case centered Mexican American families. So although segregation in California between Mexican Americans and whites was not required by law, Beginning with the waves of migrant workers from Mexico in the late 1920s, municipalities and communities enacted their own version of Jim Crow policies. So similar to the American South's Jim Crow signs of whites only and colored designations for public services, stores and eating establishments um, in California erected their own signs with things that said like no Mexicans or dogs or only allowed Mexican swimmers in public pools for one day a week. So in Southern California, schools too were segregated by race. Some statistics say that by 1940, more than 80% of Mexican American children, students in California went to so-called Mexican schools, allegedly for their own good. But those schools were not actually sites of learning, unless you mean learning how to be farm workers or domestics. These schools, like the ones in the Jim Crow South, were never equal to white schools, although physically separate. It's worth noting, however, that there was no law requiring the segregation of Mexican American children, although there were laws separating Asian American and American Indian children. So a group of families headed by Gonzalo Mendez filed an action in federal district court challenging the system of what were essentially apartheid schools. So these, rep these plaintiffs represented over 5,000 children, all citizens of the United States and of Mexican descent. The case centered on the fact that the education code allowed for separating American Indian and children of Chinese, Japanese, and Mongolian descent, but there was no such exception for school attendance for Mexican American children. And accordingly then, separating Mexican American children was contrary to state education law. So I tell this history for two reasons. One, it shows that there are many groups who have been engaged in the fight for school equality and not just black Americans. So it shows how groups are alike in some sense. But second, it shows that there are important historical and now contemporary contexts surrounding group struggles with white supremacy that are not equally and easily boiled down. In Mendez, importantly, the case was not found to be about racial discrimination, or according to the court, Mexican American children were considered to be white and not their own category. So this is obviously a difference than the context of Brown, where black children were decidedly not white. But the district court in Mendez was also clear in its disapproval of the system on the basis of social equality, just like the social equality argument that the Supreme Court articulated in Brown. So the moral to this story for me is just because we see similar patterns between racial groups does not mean that those patterns have arisen out of similar processes. So this is why, although I readily admit to using the colloquial term black and brown in my educational inequality work to emphasize the similarities between the two groups in outcomes, it's woefully inadequate to explain processes. So exploring the roots of this difference, of course, goes back to slavery. So 90% of all enslaved Africans brought to the Americans, Americas were actually taken to Latin America and the Caribbean, while only 5% were brought to what is now the United States. In my research, I talk about how anti-Black racism is steeped in many Latinx countries and communities, and it's not a fact or a thing that we can just easily overlook. 
And an important study showing why patterns of racial segregation exist, researchers found that Latinx folks were more likely to reject Black neighbors than neighbors of any other group. Another study of interracial relations looked at attitudes towards interracial marriage and found that Latinx folks listed Black people as their least desirable partners and that Latinx folks are more likely to marry whites than are Blacks. Even the term brown derives from the Chicano movement's embrace of brownness to distinguish themselves from Blackness and the Black experience in the United States. So given this background, discussing Black and brown as if they are interchangeable flies in the face of contemporary realities. And none of this is to say that there isn't also anti-Latinx sentiment in Black communities, but it is to highlight the fact that even though we often group these two together, on the ground, not often are there coalitions being made um, in a way that can actually lead to reform. However, the outcomes for Black and Latinx students often come out the same, right? But that also doesn't mean that the white supremacy that they're facing in their schools are the same. So as one so set of sociologists explained, Latinx folks are often seen as immigrant interlopers, while Black folks are seen as intractable criminals. In my own work, this distinction plays out often. In schools, Latinx children are pegged as perpetual English learners, despite the fact that in many areas, of course, what we now call the United States was once Mexico, and the border itself is an artificial barrier of politics rather than of culture. And that many Mexican American families have been here, as in, in the United States, much longer than most Europeans. But one thing we also see is that Latinx high school graduates have higher rates of college enrollment these days than do their white counterparts and much higher enrollments than do black students. On the other hand, black students are seen as inherently bad where studies show that teachers tend to look for misbehavior in black boys more than any other group, including Latinx boys. One thing that we talk about a lot, the school to prison pipeline is a distinctly black phenomena. So while Latinx students are expelled and suspended at percentages that actually mirror their school enrollment percentages, black children experience suspensions and expulsions at twice the expectation given their enrollment percentages. They're also referred to law enforcement and arrested at school at rates that exceed what would be expected given their enrollment numbers. However, this data also probably hides very important contextual nuances um, at the granular level. So what I just talked about was national level. But I, one thing I'll tell you about is in my own school district and where I do a lot of my research and my children go to school, um, Black and Latinx uh, issues as well as issues for English language learners are actually very, very different. So within our five elementary schools, the racial groups are unevenly dispersed. It's important to understand why that is occurring, including issues of racial segregation and residential segregation that actually separates Blacks and Latinx from each other, as well as Black from whites and Latinx from whites. There's also issues of how it is that Black and Latinx children, the perceptions of those children, are prompting whites to flee from certain schools. So I'll tell you a little bit what I see in the schools that I look at and why it's important to really separate out black from brown. So um, in this district, which is uh, approximately 35% Latinx, 30% white, and then everyone else kind of fitting in the middle, um, Latinx students tend to attend one of the five elementary schools and blacks another. Now, unsurprisingly, children designated as English language learners tend to be segregated in the same school as our Latinx students, who most of whom are not English language learners. So at all five schools, Black children test more poorly than all other students, including Latinx students, except at the two schools that have the most Black students. Black students perform the worst among all five schools at the predominantly Latinx school. Now at the whitest schools, the groups that perform similarly to each other, as well as dismally below the performance of Asian and white students. So I think all of these questions are really interesting to look at 
and to solve. And it's the way when we lump together black and brown, it stops us from looking at these differences between the two groups. So why is it that in this small-ish uh, municipality, why is it that Latinx folks live separate from black folks? Why do black children do worse in Latinx schools, even worse than they do in predominantly white schools? Is it because of the overall resources that are available to that school? Is it because of anti-Blackness or is there an issue of parental advocacy? What's important here again is that using Black and Brown suggests that Black folks and Latinx folks are equal in the racial hierarchy. And here is where I'll push back a little bit against what Professor uh, Dio says, although I think that she's right overall. It is true that Black people tend to be at the bottom of all measures of well-being, and that has not really changed over the years. However, as my colleague Laura Gomez writes in her new book, Inventing Latinos, that doesn't mean that we need not really look at the racist experiences of other people in this country. But the United States is a racial state that is built on racial hierarchy, where whiteness remains at the top of the pyramid. On the other side, who is non-white has involved more and more by figuring out what groups are closest to Black people and keeping them on the bottom. Again, this is not to say the Latinx folks do not experience racism. The death of 13-year-old Adam Toledo, a Latinx child in Chicago, killed by the police, shows that. It only means so that the Latinx experience of racism is not the same as the Black experience of racism, and both deserve their own attention. So to kind of wrap up here, I wanna argue that lumping black and brown may actually be pretty counterproductive, even when we're trying to resist white supremacy. So my suggestion, much like uh, the previous speaker, is that we need to advocate, not necessarily for different language or different acronyms, but to be specific about the group that you're talking about based on the problem that you're trying to solve. This does require some background knowledge, right, of the problem. It requires you to learn more about what it is that you're seeing, but then it also um, has to be a willingness to buck many of these trends, BIPOC perhaps being one of them, because they're asking for easy, simple explanations that actually don't exist. All right, that's my time. I look forward to the discussion. Brilliant, thank you so much, Professor Baldwin-Clark. Again, everyone, if you have questions, please post them to the Q&A box and we will uh, tackle them after all of our panelists have spoken. So uh, now we will hear from Professor Carlson. Carlson, pardon me. Thank you. I want to thank the ABA and um, Professor Dow, who originally um, reached out to me. I'm honored to be here and honored to be on this panel. Um, and I think my comments are just going to expand on what we have already heard, but take us in a slightly different direction. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that I live and work in Wewetenong, which is now what we would refer to as the Detroit metropolitan area. This is the ancestral and contemporary homeland of my Anishinaabek that means Odawa, Badawatomi, and Ojibwe or Chippewa relatives. Um, and I want to recognize the inherent sovereignty of the 12 federally recognized governments in the state of Michigan and thank them for their stewardship in this land in the past and for generations yet to come. Um, so now I wanna share my screen um, so you don't get to look at beautiful, the beautiful land behind me. Um, and and address the concerns that I have. So if you'll just bear with me, I'm kind of slow. Um, so as a federal Indian law scholar, I welcome a project like BIPOC that seeks to increase the visibility of Indians as indigenous people and center their experiences as key to anti-racism projects in the United States. The invisibility of Native peoples is real and well-documented in their dispossession and genocide has been central to the creation and perpetuation of the United States. 
Um, I want to start by saying that I am assuming that any anti-racism project involving indigenous or native peoples has to address the legacies of settler colonialism or, this, or the dispossession, political control, and genocide of the original inhabitants of the territory that the United States now claims. Based on settler colonialism, racism in the native or indigenous context in the US often differs from other groups. And that's because American Indians and Alaska natives retain aspects of their inherent sovereignty and governing authority over their peoples and their lands. The United States has always and continues to recognize a government to government relationship with 574 American Indian and Alaska Native nations. Thus, while other people of color often seek full participation in the United States, Native people often seek recognition of their separate status as distinct governments and peoples. And in talking about dismantling racism in the United States, we have to keep these differences in mind. Um, I'm concerned about whether BIPOC can meet its goals because it uses a very broad term, indigenous, and assumes that we know and agree on who is indigenous. I cannot answer the question of who is indigenous, if who is indigenous, um, but I can illustrate how one legacy of white supremacy and settler colonialism is that it has made answering that question extremely difficult. Um, and how we answer that question is extremely important because it informs who we are trying to make visible and whose experiences we think are central to dismantling racism in the United States. So I wanna illustrate my concerns about the use of the term indigenous and BIPOC by talking about the various terms that are used for native people and the larger debates in the US about who to include in that group. I wanna to suggest to you that part of dismantling racism and settler colonialism is understanding the contestation of these terms and their legal history. So I wanna start with the project or with the language that, that BIPOC uses, which is indigenous. When I first heard about BIPOC, um, I have to admit, I was confused by the use of the term indigenous. It's not a term I normally think of when referring to native people in the United States, because I think of it as more of an international term. So prior to joining academia, I worked as a human rights lawyer and we represented tribes and other native communities in the Americas at the United Nations and the Organization of American States. And we use the word indigenous all the time because it was central to the projects that we were working on and thinking about the larger world of native people. Um, I don't really use it anymore. And I don't use it anymore because my research now is really focused just on the United States and on legislative advocacy by American Indians and Alaska natives. And in the US, we frequently use other terms collectively to identify the earliest known inhabitants of what we now call the United States. So you may have heard some of these terms, American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander. All of these groups may be more broadly referred to as Native, as Native American. Of course, this is another controversial term and it's one that doesn't have a universally agreed upon definition. Some define it as a member of any of the groups that were living in the Americas or the Western Hemisphere before Europeans arrived, while others state that the definition is more limited to the US or North America. And my point here is that I think of indigenous as a broad international term for anyone who originally lived on the land. So I'm thinking Sami in Finland, Mosquito in Nicaragua, Inuit in the Arctic, um, various tribal groups in, in Africa, um, the Kaw Nation in the United States. And I looked this up because I wasn't sure if I really knew what it meant after I thought about it. And it turns out that that's actually the common use of the word. 
Um, according to Merriam-Webster's online dictionary, indigenous is as of or relating to the earliest known inhabitants of a place and especially a place that was colonized by a now dominant group. So I found this really, really puzzling because that definition basically covers any native or indigenous person in the whole world. And so I wondered, is that what it means in this context? Is that what indigenous means in BIPOC? Um, so I searched the web to see if I could figure out what the indigenous and BIPOC actually means. And the first places that I looked, of course, were on the BIPOC project website, which doesn't have a definition at all. Um, I did eventually find a definition in an article by Kendra Cherry called, what does the anacronym BIPOC mean? And she says that the indigenous and BIPOC refers to groups native to the Americas who were here before the colonization by Europeans. This includes Native Americans, as well as indigenous peoples from the Americas who have later immigrated to the US. So this is narrower than the broad international definition of indigenous, but it's also a lot broader than what I normally think of when we talk about native people in the US. And it didn't strike me as necessarily consistent with the purposes of the BIPOC anacronym, which are to undo native invisibility, anti-blackness, dismantle white supremacy and advance racial justice. And this is the one that I think is particularly um, problematic for the, for the definition, highlight the unique relationship to whiteness that indigenous and black people have, which shapes the experiences of in relationship to white supremacy, for all people of, con of color within the US context. If these are the purposes of the term, then the definition that I found for indigenous is overbroad because it basically covers any native person in the Americas with a tie to the United States. And that concerns me because it's basically lumping together very different people with very different experiences instead of contending with the legacy of racism and settler colonialism in the United States, which has a very distinctive history. So I wanna talk about this very distinctive history because I think it helps us see how a broad definition of indigenous might actually be diluting the term and making it less useful instead of actually doing what it's supposed to. Um, so I wanna talk about this very distinctive history of settler colonialism and how is it, it has affected the language used in referring to native people in the US. And to do this, we have to start with the law. Um, since its formation, the United States has dealt with American Indians by establishing legal relationships with them as separate political communities, commonly referred to as tribes or nations. The US entered into treaties with tribes which recognize their pre-existing and ongoing rights and governmental authority. These treaties, along with statutes and court decisions, form the basic legal relationship between Indian nations, their people, and the US government today. And this is a massive body of law. Um, it includes an entire section of the United States Code, section 25, hundreds of court decisions and close to 400 treaties, many of which are still legally binding today. And it's this body of law that actually defines who is native under federal law in the United States today. And the term that this law uses is not indigenous, it's Indian. And Indian is and has been defined in US law since at least the 1700s. So let's talk about what that means. Um, so I've told you it's defined by federal law, um, but here's the tricky part and where it gets complicated. There's no one definition. Definitions vary by federal statutes and when statutes don't define them, the courts fill in the terms. To the extent there's any consistency in these definitions, we know that the federal government almost always recognizes a citizen of a federally recognized Indian tribe or Alaska native village as an Indian. But sometimes non-citizens or non-tribal members are also recognized as Indian. Um, sometimes, and the criteria for this varies. 
They may include ancestry, community acceptance, but it very much depends on the courts and the actual statute at issue. And being Indian under federal law comes with serious consequences. These consequences include, but are not limited to, subjection to federal or tribal rather than state criminal law, eligibility for federal benefits and employment preferences, exemptions from state taxation, child welfare, and other civil authority, and entitlements to inherit certain traced or restricted lands. Um, and because I want to drive home the point that there are consequences to being Indian under federal law, I had to give you all a picture um, of the fact that you could be subject to tribal police or federal police instead of state police. Now there's a second aspect to this that's important, and that is that under US law, Indian is not just a racial classification, it's a political classification. In 1974, in Morton versus Mankari, the Supreme Court that held that Indians have a distinct political identity as citizens of separate sovereign tribal governments. The court upheld a federal statute preferring Indians in employment at the Bureau of Indian Affairs because the statute did not classify on the basis of race because it only applied to Indians who are members of federally recognized tribes and of one fourth or more degree of Indian blood. Four years later, in Santa Clara Pueblo versus Martinez, the Supreme Court affirmed that tribal governments have the sovereign authority to determine their citizenship. That means that each tribal government defines its own citizenship criteria. These citizenship criteria vary greatly and almost all include some kind of ancestry requirement. So what does this tell us about who counts as Indian or indigenous? Basically, it tells us that figuring out who counts as Indian, because that's the legal term I'm gonna use that right now, isn't as simple as it sounds. The answer really depends on several various factors because an individual can count as Indian for some purposes, but not others. An Indian or indigenous identity may not just be racial or ethnic, it can be cultural, it can be political. Now for some people, their cultural, racial, legal, and political identity align, but not for everyone. And this is what makes this much more complicated. For example, a person can be an enrolled tribal citizen, so politically and legally Indian under federal law, but racially both black and Indian. Another person may be ethnically or culturally Indian, but not eligible for tribal citizenship. So the person counts as Indian for affirmative action and census purposes, but not politically because they're not a tribal member and maybe not legally for other purposes under federal law. All of this said, the BIPOC idea seems to be interested in centering indigenous as a racial or ethnic identity. So we could question whether that approach really allows us to dismantle white supremacy and adequately address settler colonialism and how to classify Indians and other natives, whether we should do it politically or racially or both or some other way. Um, but I wanna put those questions to, to the side. Um, and I wanna treat the idea of indigenous peoples as a racial ethnic identity seriously. But then I think we have to ask another question, which is who gets to decide a person's racial or ethnic identity? There's a sense outside of native communities that we get to self-identify and pick how we claim who we are. But inside native or Indian communities, this is heavily contested. And this contestation reflects the legacy of settler colonialism. Pre-contact, the answer of who is Indian would have been easy. The group or tribe would have decided. And most tribes had very liberal citizenship rules. Basically, if you were living in the tribe's territory and you married into the tribe and had a relationship with the tribe, you were a citizen. All of your descendants would then be citizens. 
But that's not how it works in today's world, which has changed dramatically due to over 500 years of contact and several pernicious racist US policies targeting tribes and their people. So tribal citizenship is much more limited today. Citizenship decisions are highly political, especially when there's money, land, or resources at stake, and not necessarily reflective of who is or should be part of the community. So if the tribe decides, we may be in a situation where only tribal citizens are indigenous. Now there are two really easy benefits to this. One is it empowers tribes as sovereigns, which is a huge step in recognition of what we need to dismantle settler colonialism. And this is my favorite as a lawyer, um, it's a nice, easy, clear way to draw a line. So it makes it very easy and simple. But there are downsides too. And that's because we know that tribal citizenship is under-inclusive. A person can be 100% racially Indian, but not qualify for tribal citizenship, or have some ancestry, speak the language and participate in the community, but not be eligible for tribal citizenship. So there may be reasons why we want indigenous as a racial ethnic identity, not to mirror Indian as a political and legal identity. But then we're left to the question I posed earlier, which is who is decide, who decides? The individual? Many tribal governments and tribal citizens reject self-identification as undermining their sovereign right to define themselves. The other problem with self-identification is it doesn't give us any guidelines. And it raises really complicated questions about who gets to self-identify. So I have some options for you. Um, the first one is the obvious one, which is tribal. Oh, it's not behind me, sorry. I have it behind me when I teach, which is tribal citizens. Um, the second one is individuals with documented ties or ancestry to a US, to a US tribe. And there's some sense that there are a number of people who can't be tribal citizens who fall into the second category, who have a legitimate claim. Some tribes have actually tried to deal with what they call the descendancy problem. So it's people who are of Indian descent but can't be enrolled. Um, another option, but not all tribes have, and not all tribes think that we should be dealing with individuals who don't meet tribal citizenship requirements. And um, the second one is anyone com com claiming descent from an Indian tribe in the US. And this is where the categories start to get harder and, and more problematic, because then we have to ask, how broadly do we do, do we is the inclusion here? Does this include non-Indian people with no actual claim to Indianness? So the person that, the example that comes to my mind is Andrea Smith, who has been active in the violence against women movement and has claimed that she was a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. It turns out that the Cherokee Nation has repeatedly asked her to quit saying that she is Cherokee um, because there is no documentation anywhere. They've looked into her genealogy that she has any tie to the Cherokee Nation. Um, what about individuals who think they have Indian ancestors, but they don't know the name of their tribe and have never tried to find out or reconnect with their Indian identity or they can't because the paperwork has been lost or they have other complicated situations like that. In our digital age um, of DNA testing, what about anyone who ancestry says has Indian DNA? Do they count? Are they indigenous? Um, this seems like it could be particularly problematic because ancestry cannot tell you what tribe you are. And that raises the question, if you don't know your tribe, are you really indigenous? Um, what about anyone with descent from any indigenous tribe in the Americas? Um, to some extent, BIPOC seems to suggest that that's who they're counting as indigenous. Um, but that seems very over-inclusive. And then I have to ask, what about Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders in the US territories? Do they fall in the indigenous category? Do they not? Legally, sometimes Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders get treated like American Indians and Alaska Natives, but sometimes they don't. They get split out into their own situation. And there's an ongoing debate about what should be the proper relationship between Native Hawaiians and the United States. Each of these groups 
have different histories and different experiences. So who we make visible and whose experiences we emphasize depends on who we include. For example, a Mayan immigrant from Guatemala does not share the same historical or contemporary experiences or political relationship with the United States as a citizen of the Muscogee Creek Nation of Oklahoma. And a person with a family history of an Indian ancestor, but no idea about their tri tribal affiliation does not have the same experiences as a Lakota Sioux raised on the reservation or an urban Amish Anishinaabek who has been raised in their culture. And empirical studies bear out the differences among these groups. For example, there's an infamous Annenberg study that asked people who self-identified as Native Americans if they supported Indian mascots. And it actually found that the majority did. Yet similar studies done among tribal citizens don't support the use of Indian mascots and find them patently offensive. So I'm gonna go back to what I said earlier, which is that I can't answer the question of who is indigenous in BIPOC or who it should be. Um, ideally members of the group, whoever that group is, would have a say and be engaged in this discussion. Um, what I wanna do here is emphasize that how we answer the question of who is indigenous in BIPOC has real consequences. First, if we don't answer it, we leave the term overly broad and ambiguous and we risk elevating a term without any real meaning because we don't know who we want to make visible or what experiences are central to dismantling racism. In that case, we aren't really raising the visibility of indigenous peoples and their experiences or dismantling racism against them. Second, how we answer this question is important because if BIPOC wants to center the indigenous experience, we have to know who is indigenous. Otherwise, we don't know who we're talking about who we're making visible, how they've been affected by racism in the United States and why those experiences need to be highlighted to dismantle the legacy of settler colonialism. All of this just goes to show how important language is and how careful we should be in using terms as we embark on the long overdue and much needed anti-racism projects in the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Carlson. So let's now uh, leap into the very good questions that have been posted by our many attendees. I've been trying to group them together and the, the first set um, I think has to do with the, um, the boundaries that we've identified uh, and that we've discussed in all of our various talks. So let me just read to you some of these questions. Doesn't, so this one is from Dan O'Donnell. Doesn't the term people of color confuse racial and cultural identity? Many La Latinos and Latinas um, uh, are, are white as are many Arab Americans, he says. Um, he also wrote, I've never heard a Latino or Latina use the term Latinx. Doesn't that seem to suggest a lack of respect for their culture? The first speaker referred to the importance of giving names to things. Doesn't this imply persons of other cultures should respect the term Latinos and Latinas use to identify themselves? Similarly, a couple of other attendees have said, um, uh, Jacqueline Biddle Richard, for example, Afro Latinos are a highly marginalized group within the Latino community. Has anyone researched this area of racism. Uh, there are some questions about whether there is a generational divide here in that there are many young Latinos and La Latinas and Latinxes using the, the term La Latinx and they themselves are Latino um, or Latinx. Uh, could it be that there's a gener generational split then? And then finally, Angie Martel uh, posted this question, uh, my concern is the separation of black and brown. When you celebrate, what, sorry, when you separate black and Latinx, however, that is understanding uh, that when you say black, you mean black American. My concern is that you exclude black Afro Caribbean people that are Latinx and Latin also. There is no way that racism 
uh, there is no question that racism is a big concern in the Latinx community, but in dividing black and brown in such a way, it obliterates the Latinx that are black from the islands, indigenous people like Tainos, and obliterates the colonialism and slavery that subjects our people to their multitudes of identities and perpetuates the genocide of our people, especially Boricua, Cuban, and Caribbean people born in North Africa with ancestors from the Caribbean. And so there were other posts uh, that were similar to these. I thought I would read these and then just open it up to reflections, answers, etc. Who would like to go first? I will. Um, I think that all of these questions um, really just hint at or suggest strongly, I think, exactly what we're talking about here. But it's really important to be specific about what communities you're talking about and the problems that you're trying to solve when you are referring to those communities. Um, so one thing I think also is important is that um, it, the question of race versus culture, I think, comes up all of the time. I think what's important to remember is that there's nothing um, particularly biological about race, right? And so if, if, if it's the case that we say, oh, well, most Latinx people or many Latinx people are white, that may really be just because of how people have been forced to fit into racial categories, not actually a meaningful um, thing to most Latinx people, right? I talk to Latinx people that, no, we're not white, <laughs> we're Latinx, and that's just a failure of figuring out, um, it's a failure of who we consider to be a racial group and who we don't. Um, and so I, I kind of push back on, on that a little bit and to say, you know, if you, if, if, that being that, I think I also responded um, privately to the discussion about Afro-Latinx people, which I think is actually really, really important. Um, but it goes again to the idea that we need to be specific about who we're talking about. And even when I gave you my statistics, um, they are necessarily very broad and open to interpretation, right? Who decided that when they were saying this was a Latinx student, who decided that that student was Latinx? Who decided that a student was Black? Who decided any of those things? And so that's also really important to remember that our statistics may actually be misleading um, if we're really thinking about people's lived experiences in their own bodies on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, great answer. Kirsten, Mira? Uh, thank you for sort of broadly covering a lot of those topics, Professor Baldwin-Clark. Um, I'll take us even one step earlier just to remind people in the audience that most academics today think of race as a social construct, not as something that is inherently biologically created. Um, it has certainly lived realities for people from different backgrounds, um, but it is a social construct. And so when Professor Baldwin Clark talks about folks being sort of pushed into different categories or boxes, um, certainly the lived experience, for example, of Afro Latinos is um, distinct from people who are Black and not don't consider themselves Latino, or from Latinos who don't consider themselves also Black. Um, but we should keep in mind that these are categories that tend to be forced on people. And then we can you know, take what, we're, what opportunities we have to create solidarity and find opportunities for mutual benefit and political power. Um, but that doesn't take away from the fact that at their core, they are identity characteristics that are more foisted upon us. Many people don't really feel like they fit within traditional boxes. Dean Verona introduced that at the very beginning um, to sort of create a framework for our conversation today. So um, the, the question about Arab Americans, for example, is a perfect illustration of this as well. I, I personally know very few Arab Americans who want to be considered white, um, and yet the US Census still puts them in the white category, Palestinians and Israelis together. Right, And so um, there are lots of ways in which we can think about the categories that we have and think about how we can push against them. Um, I really appreciated Professor Carlson raising questions that she knows we cannot answer, um, which is why I appreciate as well the, the title given for today's presentation as a whole. It is wrestling with words. And I, I know I've seen from the very many thoughtful questions, um, both in the Q&A and in the chat, that many of you in the audience are looking for us as experts on issues of race. Um, 
and identity to share actual answers. Um, and we don't have those answers either. We're here to wrestle with these terms and with how to move an anti-subordination and anti-racism agenda forward using the terms that we have and thinking through, well, is Latinx better in the sense that it's not um, prioritizing one gender over another, but do we really want to use a term that, you know, like none of my friends' parents use <laughs> that you can't even say in the actual language? And so um, this is why we're wrestling with the terms. And um, I'm grateful that we can do this in a really thoughtful way together, even if we don't come out of today with an actual answer to the questions that we're asking. Thank you, Mira. Kirsten, did you have anything? I want to thank both um, uh, both of my colleagues for their great responses. I just want to highlight that um, building on what Mira said, it's not just that you get forced into a category, but you can get forced out. And, and I think yeah. that's one of the huge frustrations that we see with these terms in, in Native communities, right? I mean, I spend a lot of time talking about the legal definition, but that excludes people. And, and not just people from the, the continental US. I mean, it, it excludes a number of other indigenous groups like Tainos in, in um, Puerto Rico. And it also though can exclude people in other ways. And this is why the con construct is so important. I mean, I, I constantly have students who either look what we stereotypically think of as black or white who are in world tribal members. And so their personal identity is completely different from the identity that is constantly assigned to them. Um, and I mean, you just have to imagine what it's like when you go somewhere and you check the box and somebody says, really, is that what you are? Um, so the, the forcing goes both ways. And some of it isn't just the social constructs that we as people use, but some of it's legal constructs too that affect how you get identified and what that means. Um, and I think it's important to have these conversations because they really are a legacy of the history in this country and that we can't move beyond them if we can't have open dialogue and realize these are really hard questions that we may not be able to come up with the right answer to. Wonderful, great, great answers. So there's this other grouping of questions that I think highlight the challenge around who it is that gets to decide what the answers are to these various questions. And so let me share a few of these. An anonymous attendee wrote, do any of the panelists have insights on language used to describe people of two or more races? How does specificity or lack thereof with regard to language prioritize or fail to include these people? How might their experiences be excluded or misrepresented in research and data an analysis? A couple of other comments that are linked to that one in uh, several ways. Michelle Curtis uh, writes, the discussion around semantics and wording is crucial to be had. I wonder that there is a great deal of socio-political momentum currently to make fundamental changes to address racism and its pervasive effects. But if we spend too much time discussing the semantics with no, re with no real idea of who ultimately will have the authority to make the word choices, we will lose opportunities for, ch for changing, uh, we will lose opportunities for change this momentum currently presents. Please share your thoughts on this issue of detail versus doing. And then finally, Sherry and Scott posted, thank you for your perspectives on not on not using encompassing terms such as BIPOC, but along the line of Professor Carlson's presentation, do Professors Clark and Deo have thoughts on how to determine which terms to use in our efforts to be specific to each specific group, Black versus African American, Latinx versus Latino A, as mentioned above. I've also seen people argue that we should separate AA from PI and the AAPI label. It's often a personal preference and self-determination is best, but how should advocates choose when talking about a community? So they, they all sort of point to who gets to decide what the answers are, right? Yeah, these are fabulous questions. And thank you, Dean Verona, for grouping them together in that way. Um, 
again, there aren't necessarily easy answers, but um, I think there are ways to talk through some of this. Um, what a lot of people talk and write about as the multiracial category um, is one that I find really interesting to um, think about and to do research about. I'm going to drop a link in the chat um, to a book by my Fordham Law School colleague, um, Tanya Hernandez, who uh, has written on this topic herself. And um, I will say that it is a group that I write about as a group, um, both in the work that I do with law students and LESI, as well as in my own research with faculty members. What's complicated, I think, about the multiracial category is that it's difficult to say that there is a multiracial experience. Um, I have a, a new article that's forthcoming in the North Carolina Law Review that looks at this specifically because the, the multiracial category is itself not just an umbrella group, like Asian American is an umbrella group, but it's a group that is made up of people that have themselves very distinct identities, not only in terms of nation and language, um, but even just in terms of uh, you know, the various subgroups within the um, larger multiracial category. And so it's difficult to say whether the experience uh, experiences of someone who identifies as multiracial because um, her ancestors are Black and Asian American has the same experiences as someone who identifies as multiracial because her ancestors are Japanese and white, right? And yet we group these people together as if they have one experience. Um, I do have research that shows that there are um, experiences of multiracial students as a whole um, where you can say, I think, something about them as a group. Um, there were some questions as well about the Lessie data that I shared. And so I've put a link in the chat to that um, most recent annual report, which I titled Diversity and Exclusion. And in this report, I do talk about multiracials distinctly as a category. Um, although, again, it's, it's uncomfortable in many ways to do so because we know that um, people, even within the multiracial category, may not see one another as... Um, coming from the same background, even though they have a background that is distinct from people from monoracial backgrounds. Um, so, you know, that's sort of the first broad question about multiracials. Um, the second point, Dean Brona, that you brought up, I, I know it wasn't exactly this way, but it, it, in my mind, I sort of read it as, you know, if BIPOC, the term has momentum, should we just go with it, right? Like this, is this a way to sort of get to some of the anti-racism goals that um, many of us are working towards. And so, you know, maybe it's okay that the term is not fantastic, but if, if it's getting us somewhere, should we go with it anyway? My, my concern with BIPOC is that it's not necessarily doing the work. It's not necessarily getting us closer to the goals, um, but it is, I think, creating divisions and creating some harms, both in terms of utilizing the indigenous name as Professor Carlson mentioned without really identifying what is meant by it, but even more problematic from my perspective, using the name literally in name only, including the I as part of the term BIPOC when often the data doesn't even exist to talk about indigenous groups. Um, and so we're sort of lumping this group together to signal that we care without actually doing the work to move the agenda of that group forward. Um, so that's one of my main concerns. And then also that it is creating divisions within the broader people of color community by relegating groups like Asian Americans and those in the Latinx or Latino community to the margins, to the peripheries, um, rather than drawing on broad solidarity. Um, the last thing I'll say is just um, to mention that um, certainly there are complications with regard to how we use terms for particular groups. The one that I'll mention um, or draw on that was mentioned is including Pacific Islanders with Asian Americans. This I think suffers from the same challenges of BIPOC because we, we use the term in the Asian American community to be inclusive of Pacific Islanders and yet often the data does not exist. And so we're talking about Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders as a group and yet the data itself or the arguments we're making are really only about Asian Americans. And so centering that group in name only, I think still does a disservice overall to the broader anti-racism or anti-subordination goals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Professor Carlson, did you have anything or, or did, uh, did you all, do, do we need to cover anything else? Professor Baldwin-Clark? 
Um, I was just going to say about the issue of who gets to name. Um, I think it is very, very, very important. Um, and I, in, in a way, it seems like depending on the category is who gets to name, right? So if we're talking about American Indian people or Native American people, then yes, just like the United States gets to decide who's a citizen of our country, then so should Native tribes, right? That's not something that we should put on um, uh, other people. But one way I don't feel comfortable about the group naming who's in the group is I don't want um, there to be this exclusionary aspect of who is black, right? Or an exclusionary aspect of uh, who is Latinx. I think so who gets to name, I think is incredibly um, fraught um, with okay. figuring out these problems. I know when I do my own work and I do my own research, I ask people how they want to be identified. Just simply, how do you identify? And sometimes I don't even give them any kind of a prompt. I want to know, how do you identify your life? What is the most salient identity to you? And I think that that's something that's very um, powerful to, to give to people. Um, but, you know, there still is the problem of why were these racial categories um, created in the first place? Why is it that we have this? And, you know, what most social scientists will say is that race is not real, but racism is. <laughs> And what we really, I think, should be focusing on is that second part. How is it that white supremacy is working on people and their bodies in order to keep them oppressed or not having, you know, quote unquote, the good life and really, you know, uh, constraining people's life chances? In a way, that is the more important question rather than, you know, who gets to decide? Because at the end yeah. of the day, it's already decided. But then the real question is, well, how do we push back? Um, uh, someone put it in there, detail versus doing. Detail yeah. is important, but perhaps doing is more important. And, and I would agree with that. Absolutely. Let's have Professor Carlson have the last word. I don't know that I have that much to add. Um, one of the first conversations that I had with Mira when we talked about BIPOC was I said, well, what happens if you're black and indigenous? Where do you fit? Um, and because there's no doubt in my mind that that's a different experience. And how, how do we understand those experiences and highlight those experiences? And, and how do we honestly talk about the, the issues that Professor Baldwin Clark talked about when you have um, racism within people of color? And, and tensions there. And I think her saying that, you know, what, what's really important here isn't the question of necessarily race, that is fictitious. It was created to, to assign identities to people, whether they took them or not, but it's this question of how do we push back against the racism and how do we see it as, as pervasive as it really is in our world and problematic and, and move beyond that. And I wish I knew the answer because I'm sure there'd be some great wonderful prize I'd get, but I don't. So, um, I think it's just something we're going to have to continue to struggle with. What a rich and wonderful discussion. I would only add uh, to those questions and comments posted around, you know, why should we spend so much time focusing on words and on these details? Why not just focus on the action and go to it? Um, what I think about, it, what I touched upon at the start of this panel um, is the harm that was done by my community identifying itself as Hispanic, right? And for decades and decades and decades, some of our community members kept saying, that term does not really represent me and excludes me. And it's very, I, I think it's a very good thing that, that we, over the last couple of decades, have taken those complaints seriously and have seen the truth in those concerns. Uh, the same thing goes for what had been the gay civil rights movement. The gay civil rights movement, as it was called decades ago, was exclusive of quite a few members of our community who should be, who are part of the community, but are not properly included by the label gay. So, uh, so I, the, the sense that I have is that these discussions, even though they might seem to be superficial and academic, and we are just talking about words, words have tremendous power. Words include, words exclude, 
Words can define entire movements. Words convey enormous meaning. And that's why it is important for us to get the words right, understanding that words and language are living things and that this is not a conversation that we will ever finish. This is not a conversation that we will ever conclude. This is a conversation that needs to continue to be had with the language evolving together with humanity itself. So I thank my dear colleagues very, very much. And I thank you all for joining us this afternoon for this free webinar. We'd like to express our gratitude to this esteemed group of panelists and scholars. You're all doing such critically important work and we Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to share your wisdom with us. The section of civil rights and social justice provides free webinars and resources for legal professionals and advocates nationwide and really worldwide. We hope this helps you, this all helps you in your work. And again, if you can, please consider joining and becoming uh, active members in the ABA section. You may do so at AMBAR, A-M-B-A-R, dot org slash c r s j not i as i mistakenly read earlier today ambar dot org slash c r s j thank you everyone best of luck in your work stay safe and uh until we see each other again take care